Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got a perfumers portfolio video, double header. Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these, mostly because I knocked out most of my favorite perfumers already, but there are still some that are very worthy of being highlighted and recognized. And if you've been following my channel, you know that's basically what this whole thing is about. Uh, that's the whole reason I've been doing this channel, is to highlight some of my favorite fragrances with you guys, give you views that are outside of the uh, Fragcom, the people who, you know, say nice things about fragrances because they get free bottles. Against the grain, I like to go there. And also to give credit to the people behind the scenes, and who more important than the perfumers themselves. So, plus I think this is a cool way to talk about a bunch of fragrances at once. So, I, I did have to go to the office today, hence the dress. Anytime you see me in a shirt like this, you know it was an office day for me. And, um, whenever I go to the office, I've been avoiding wearing my heavy ouds or my real animalic fragrances. I've been trying to wear stuff that's more, um, uh, more easygoing, let's say, more likable by large groups of people. Uh, and today I wore one of the most compliment beast fragrances, if you will. This is a 2015 batch of Creed's Aventus, uh, the hype beast of hype beasts. And you can kind of see the color of the older Aventus isn't as clear, uh, as the newer batches. This is, um, 15Y01 for those of you batch code freaks. Honestly, I've got three or four bottles. I would actually sell one of these bottles maybe even because as much as I like this, it doesn't do it for me like it used to back in the day. You know, five, six years ago, I used to be able to wear this for a week straight and not get bored of it. Halfway through the day, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for something else. Although, to be fair, uh, I did get a compliment. I wouldn't, I would call it an unsolicited uh, recognition of the fragrance. Um, at work, where we badge in, we have security officers, and one of them uh, said, oh my god, you smell amazing, and I did my usual, thank you, you know, uh, that's that's how I always respond to com to compliments, compliments, or comments, I'm always just like, you know, yes, thank you, and gracefully take the comment and move on, um, and, but it does get, people do like this fragrance for whatever reason, it doesn't offend, it doesn't, uh, you know, um, this sort of fresh fruity thing, and it is technically a Shifra fragrance, and that's why I do wear it, um, you know, willingly, let's say, because these older batches, um, have this amazing contrast of that pineapple, apple, black currant, that trifecta of fruitiness in the top, and then, um, there's some jasmine and patchouli in the, in the heart, and the base is all about the um, birch, that smoky birch. That's what gives it the smoky note, is the birch. And these older batches, uh, I feel like they have more oak moss. And oak moss, um, you know, grounds the fragrance. You can't have a sheafer without oak moss. And I think the later batches of Aventus, oak moss was removed uh, and replaced. And I think Creed has messed with the formula from month to month, year to year. Every batch that they put out is a little bit different. Uh, in the Ghost Perfumer book, uh, the guy who wrote it, Gabe Oppenheim, said that even uh, Jean-Christophe Harreau, who created the fragrance, didn't know that Creed was playing with the batches from year to year to try to make people think, oh, it's because of the natural ingredients. One batch is more smoky, one batch is more fruity, and you know, you'd have uh, Aventus heads who would buy 10, 20, 50 bottles of Aventus because they had to find the grail batch and it turned into a phenomenon. It basically gave Creed the billion dollar sale price that BlackRock paid for it. I think they overpaid. I think they heavily overpaid because, um, and somebody got pissed off at me for saying this. And by the way, if you get pissed off at stuff that I say on here, you're probably on the wrong channel. But someone got mad that I said new Aventus um, batches suck. And they do. I think they're terrible. I've smelled a lot of them. Um, you know, I don't go out of my way, but if I'm ever at the mall or something and, and, uh, I'm at one of the higher end designer stores, I'll go have a sniff of current Aventus and it smells absolutely horrible. It's treacherous what they've done to Aventus. In fact, some of the clones of Aventus now are starting to smell even better than Aventus. So for me, 2017 is the cutoff. If you can get a bottle 2017 or before, go for it. 
If you have to go to 2018 or 19, it's complete shite. In fact, I bought a flat cone of a 2018 batch, and it's so bad that I am boycotting ever buying any new creeds ever until I get like an apology or a refund or recognition of the uh, absolute con job that I got. I mean, I would literally douse myself with 2018 Aventus and then go to work, and in 30 minutes, no one could smell me. I mean, nobody. I couldn't even smell myself, and I had to check with other people to make sure I wasn't losing my mind. Uh, and so I, I just got absolutely swindled out of 660 bucks because I paid retail for that. And uh, it was one of those 8.4 ounce flat cones. Anyways, long story short, is I'll never buy new creeds after that uh, experience. I do think it's been heavily watered down, heavily reformulated. Um, and for me, it's the older batches. I do enjoy it. I just don't love it as much as I used to. So, uh, that was my scent of the day. So let's talk about the two perfumers we're going to highlight today. The first is a third generation perfumer. Yes, third generation. Uh, and I haven't talked about him yet. I think I did a video on his father. Uh, but this is Lucas Suizak. And I actually pulled up a blurb. Lucas wrote a... Almost like an about me. I think he works for a, a company called Euro Fragrance, um, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe that's just the, um, the uh, website where I found this blurb. But here's what he said about himself. He says, take the road less traveled. Uh, and it says, I don't think outside the box. I break the box and then stick its pieces in a bottle with other ingredients to create a fragrance. Some say that I'm a rebel but I prefer to describe myself as a non-conformist. I like that. That does appeal to me. A free thinker who won't go in the opposite direction, but rather take another road to reach a destination. I am grateful that several close family relatives who were perfumers left me with a legacy of love for fragrances. They encouraged me very young to discover the world through my senses and to value nature, in particular its smells and its tastes. This predisposition is of great relevance in my present profession as senior perfumer. When I develop a fragrance, I see to it that every ingredient plays a meaningful role in my creation. I wouldn't say that I have a favorite perfumery raw material because each one offers something special, but I will confess to going through periods in my career when I really quite become quite obsessed with a particular ingredient. I will often take this raw material du jour and see how far I can twist it and combine it to break the usual codes of perfume design. If I have a chance to work on one of your projects, I will put my creativity and passion for those raw materials in the flacon along with all the emotions you desire. That's his little sales pitch, if you will. Not bad. Um, so Lucas Swizak basically uh, created other fragrances, which I don't have in my collection. Some of the most popular ones that he created that I don't have here uh, is Play Intense by the House of Givenchy, which is too sweet for me. It came out in 2008. And um, he also did the original Play by, by Givenchy, which also came out in 2008. And uh, he did a couple other things. Uh, the Game Intense for Davidoff, 212 VIP Men for Carolina Herrera in 2011. Um, but the two that I'm going to highlight, he basically has two that are in my collection uh, one, a bottle is on the way. It'll be here soon. Uh, and I'm going to show you a sample that was sent to me, very kindly uh, sent to me. I think Dushan sent me this. And it's called Amouage Jubilation 25 for women. All right, so this is the women's version of, of Jubilation 25. The Gift of Kings, indeed. Absolutely beautiful. If you don't know why Amouage, uh, their slogan was the Gift of Kings, is whenever high-class dignitaries, uh, or high-ranking dignitaries, I should say, went to Oman on like official visits, like if the Secretary of State, for example, went to Oman, uh, something along those lines, they would literally be gifted Amouage fragrances by... Uh, the ex-king who used to rule the country. Um, Bin Kaboos? Kaboos? I, I can't remember his name. But he was an absolute le legend, and I loved his um, outlook on uh, how to motivate a country. His whole idea was basically that, you know, they needed something other than just oil to be proud of. And so he gave them amouage, something to intellectually stimulate, you know, the brain, something to... Uh, stimulate the soul, the heart of a people. I love that. I love his, um, you know, I love his outlook on things. 
And this was their creation for 25 years to celebrate Amouage's 25th anniversary. Obviously, I have the men's version right there. It's one of my favorite fragrances of all time. Jubilation Man is an absolute, you know, um, just knockout all-time great fragrance. Rich Mitch recently in a live stream said it reminds him of like Jesus and the three wise men with myrrh and frankincense and all that good stuff, gold. And I completely agree. I, I know exactly what he means when he says that. This took me a while to get to. I dismissed it outright at first because people compared it to Diaghilev and I own Diaghilev and I love Diaghilev. It's one of my favorite MY, uh, sorry, one of my favorite roses of all time. And, um, you know, this uh, uh, came out in a time where I was, I was not uh, open enough to try women's fragrances. So this sample, and he sent me two others like this, very kind of him, lots of, I've done lots of testing on it. I've, I've given it lots of spritzes and wears. And I gave it a full wear, and I actually did an entire video on it. Oh, it's so good. Go watch my um, my early impression video on Jubilation 25 for women. Uh, basically, here's the blurb. Jubilation 25 captures the moment of timeless eternity in which myth and reality are interwoven. This is created to the elegant, enigmatic, and sophisticated woman who lives her life as an art form, transcending the time, place, and cultures in which she inhabits. And... They're using the she pronoun here. Um, it's it's marketed towards women. Amouage used to do a man's and a woman release, which I like. I wish they went back to that. I don't, you know, most people on there nowadays that I see on the internet get on there and say, oh, I'm so happy Amouage dropped that. I'm not. I like that they did that. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, but so even though this is saying, you know, she and sophisticated woman, anyone can wear this. This is completely unisex. Uh, it's a spicy oriental fragrance with chifre qualities, um, and it is, um, here's the note breakdown. Tarragon, rose, ylang, ylang, and lemon. Lots of classic rose and ylang, ylang combo. So if you've ever smelled things like uh, gold by Amouage, the original gold uh, for women or men, Amouage gold man or, or woman. If you smelled silver or silver crystal, I've talked about that fragrance in the past. That uses heavy rose elaine combo, very traditional amouage um, creation, the way that the florals are used. And it sits on Divana, a bed of labdanum, rose, frankincense, ambergris, musk, myrrh, patchouli, and vetiver. And basically, um, what you get in the opening is a very spicy experience. There's a note that's not listed, and I can't believe they didn't list it. And I'm thinking they didn't list it because they were scared it would scare people off, and it's cumin. There is a huge cumin note in this, but as it dries down, as the hours go by, in the opening, you won't understand the comparison to Diaghilev, um, which again, one of my favorite perfumes of all time. Uh, it made my top 10, actually. Uh, if you've watched my top 100 countdown, I know it's a, it's a long um, commitment to watch that. But um, I did a top 100, and this made it inside of the top 10. This is one of my favorite Schieffer fragrances of all time. This is literally all the juice I have. I wish I had 10 bottles of this stuff, but it's very expensive. But I cherish every time I wear it. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, honor to wear this. Honestly, it's so good. And I know I give Roja a hard time, but then there's stuff like this out there that I just absolutely love. And this is very close to it. It does some things different. Um... But it's very, very good. It's good in its own way. And in fact, even though I love that, and even though I would love a backup bottle of that or another bottle, let's say, I still went ahead and bought a bottle of this. Or I'm buying a bottle, I should say, from uh, Mudasir. He's um, he's working on some other things for me too. Uh, and he's recovering uh, from a minor surgery. And so he is um, going to get this out to me probably within the next couple weeks or maybe a month or so. But I will have a full bottle of Jubilation 25 Woman for sure. Absolutely, it's worth it's full bottle worthy. It's a very good fragrance, and you know I don't hear many people talking about it. Uh, the man's version gets all the hype in the community, but the woman's version is very very good. And um, the only thing is I don't know about reformulation. I think this is an older um, sample because I think the new blurb that I read from the newer samples don't have all of the you know, she, an elegant, sophisticated woman, and all this stuff, they kind of went a different path with the blurb. Uh, so this could be an older sample, but this is very, very good. Um, 
and it's probably uh, 20% of the price of Diaghilev, you know, well worth it. Uh, okay, so that's the first one that Lucas Swizak did. The second one, and he did both of these in the year 2007, and they're both amouages, at least in my collection. And the second one is probably the one he's most famous for. This is the one that gets a ton of hype. So many people love this stuff, and I, and I completely see why. Um, it, it's a 2007 release, and it's called Reflection Man. And you can see the dent I've put in this bottle. That's my dent. Um, and I love wearing this stuff in the spring and summer. Um, even now where, you know, it, it gets a little cooler in the, in the, in the night. Um, and even though it gets warm, it's not like 105 degrees anymore in Texas now that it's September the 13th. Um, it's a great time. And basically any time except for winter is my favorite time to wear a reflection, man. It's very floral. It does have a sweetness, but you know how much I hate sweetness. Go watch my Astrophil and Stella review of Petty Shetty that I did yesterday, just to give you an idea of how much I literally despise sweetness in a fragrance. Uh, here, it's very well done. Uh, and this is one of the most beautiful Neroli. Uh, there's this Neroli Jasmine. This is one of my favorite executions of that uh, clean Neroli note. Neroli historically is a very uh, expensive note to use, especially when you're using high quality Neroli. And it's rounded out with iris. So what barely makes this lean even slightly masculine, I would say it's mostly feminine, traditionally feminine, but they've added this note of rosemary, which you'll find in many old school masculine fragrances. It almost like flips the switch in your brain. Like when you smell stuff like Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, you get that uh, rosemary, that herbal rosemary. It's here. Um, and it's mixed with bitter orange leaf, but it's not super bitter, but it's just enough to give that contrast. Red pepper, which again, just a little bit of peppery contrast with the iris, which makes it powdery. This is a very powdery experience. Um, if you don't like powdery fragrances, you might struggle with this one at first. I would say stick with it because it has this um, woody dry down. So there's vetiver, there's cedar wood, sandalwood, and there's a touch of patchouli. Don't think psychedelic or moods Womo uh, patchouli. Um, it's not that kind of patchouli. It's just there, I think, to add a little bit of heft. You know, this is a very, um, it's a very floral, but it also seems like a very clean. This is like, when I think of this, I think clean white shirt. That's the vibe that this fragrance gives me. Clean white shirt. Uh, and the patchouli just adds a little heft to drag it down. You don't want it so airy and clean where it floats away. You know what I mean? And so this is a beautifully contrasted, well-built fragrance and, um, ballsy, extremely ballsy release. Um, you know, and this was the type of stuff Amouage was doing back in the day. This is why I fell in love. You know, these are two prime examples of why I love Amouage so much. Now, a lot's changed since 2007, obviously. Uh, they're, they're going in a direction, the house is going in a direction that I'm not really able to follow. Um, at least not with my heart and, and my wallet. But, um, you know, I did read an article that said that Emwaj broke records for this quarterly's uh, revenue. So obviously someone is out there dropping big money on their fragrances, but uh, I feel like they've lost the plot. And um, I, I, I'm going to treat them the same way as I'm basically treating Creed. No more full Amouage bottles. No more Creed. No more retail Creed bottles. If I buy Creed or Amouage, it's going to be the old stuff. And that's just how it has to be for me. That's to my nose. Now, other people might say you're missing out on the new stuff. I do have decants coming of the new stuff. I've got a decant coming of Silver Oud, which many people have asked me about. Have you tried Silver Oud in... You know, uh, I never rushed out to get it or anything. Apparently, it's like a Fragcom darling. I had no idea, but people love it in the Fragcom. Um, and then, um, this is acai juice, by the way. Acai juice and orange juice. It's my special blend. Keep you healthy. Um, so, yes, they, they absolutely love Silver Oud. 
and the new one, Royal Tobacco, I have a decant. So I have a 5 ml decant of that and a 5 ml decant of Silver Oud. That'll be enough for me to test it, wear it, talk about it on the channel. But um, those are the two from uh, Lucas Suizak. And I believe he is the son of Jean-Louis Suizak, if I'm not mistaken, who's one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Okay, so let's talk about perfumer number two, who's going to make the, the um, perfumer's portfolio video today. His name is Rodrigue, Rodrigo Flores Rue, and um, he is a very popular uh, perfumer. He's basically a Givaudan perfumer. Um, he studied biology before moving to, to France in 89. He was born in Mexico, studied biology, moved to France in 89, attended the ISI PCA Perfumery School, which is like the prestige, the prestigious perfumery school at Versailles. And he's currently a um, perfumer with Givaudan, uh, one of the big boys, basically. And I, I pulled some quotes. So here's the selected quotes from Rodrigo Flores Rue. To me, it has been very clear that consumers are less fragrance friendly because they're confused by too many offerings, too many launches, too many flankers, too many summer editions. It would be great if all of us in the industry took a hiatus and reconvened in a year with a clear head and fresh ideas. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, I'm not kidding. A year without one single launch could prove very, very healthy. Call me crazy, but I'm certain I could find legions to support the idea. This is from an interview with Rodrigo Suarez Rue at the Fragrance Fountain. And then he says, Lily of the Valley, or Muguet, is not known in Mexico and even... If I had been told at school that the word Soliflor Muguet described Diorissimo, it became apparent that thanks to the presence of jasmine, illusion and magic could happen in this wonderful craft called perfume making. You think you smell Muguet, but you, what you are really reacting to is, yet again, Monsieur Jasmine and his art of seduction, playing a dusky bass uh, bass under the sparkling Scherzo of lilies. In my personal pantheon of perfect perfumes, Diorissimo holds court as indisputable king. So a couple quotes from him, uh, and he made a lot of Jean Barbado stuff in my collection. Uh, there is one uh, decant that I'm going to talk about that's not Jean Barbados, but he was basically the in-house perfumer of Jean Barbados for a very long time. Now, he's done other things, uh, which I'm not the biggest fan of some of the other things that he did. Um, for example, actually there is another fragrance uh, in here as well from a different house. He did a lot of stuff for Tom Ford. Like for example, he did Neroli Portofino. I don't own it, not a fan. Uh, he did um, uh, Jasmine Rouge for Tom Ford, not a fan. He did White Patchouli, never smelled it. Uh, he did a bunch of uh, Calvin Klein fragrances. He actually did a new Tom Ford too, which I'm not that big a fan of, Ebony Fume. I'd rather just wear Gucci Pour Homme 1 to be honest with you. Uh, he did Artisan Blue for um, Barbados, which I don't own. He did a bunch of Carnier fragrances. Um, he did uh, Artisan Black, which I don't own. Um, so he's got around a lot of uh, Tom Ford's, a lot of Artisan, lo uh, a lot of uh, <clears throat> John Barbados. And uh, he did The One for Men Gold by Dolce & Gabbana. That came out uh, last year, never smelled it. So he has a bunch of releases. Uh, he's got like 10 pages of release. A lot of them are Tom Ford's, Carnier's. He did some of the exclusive Dolce & Gabbana fragrances, Velvet, and Velvet Patchouli. I was never a fan of that line, ever. Uh, there's nothing there I've ever smelled that made me just want to pull out my wallet and buy a fra fragrance. Um, I think it's kind of a shit line, to be honest with you. But some of the stuff that I have here is very, very good. And you can tell that he is a great perfumer. Um, you can tell that he, uh, does a, a great job of balancing the notes. You can tell that he has a little bit of a daring side to him. And the thing about the Jean Varvedos fragrances is that they were basically, um, designer budget fragrances. You could find them very, very cheap, which is when I bought all of mine, when they basically went on sale, uh, when the house of Jean Varvedos filed for bankruptcy. The current owner is Revlon. Um, none of my fragrances are 
bottles are Revlon bottles, just so you should know. They are the previous owners, which is EA, Elizabeth Arden. Uh, I've never compared in contrast. I can't say one is better than the other. Just know what I'm smelling and talking about is the EA distribution, not the Revlon. So who knows if that makes a difference or not, but just so I can say I told you. Okay, so the first one we're going to go to is in 2004, and it's the original John Varvatos, John Varvatos, so just the regular John Varvatos, um, and, you, and they used to give you 125 mil. I don't know how big the bottle sizes are, but they've got this cool piece of leather that goes around it. It's actually a great representation of the fragrance. You can see some of the notes imprinted in the leather right there. Nice presentation, actually. Um, and what it says is tamarind, um, tamarind tree leaves, sage flower, Mediterranean herbs, uh, or amber, or amber. I don't know what that is. Maybe that's a captive molecule or amber, uh, vanilla and black leather essence. And I really like this fragrance. And the other thing that I really like about it, this is probably one of my favorite John Barbados fragrances. There's Another one coming, which maybe gives it a run for its money, or maybe I like a little bit more. But this is 2004. M7 from YSL, which is uh, credited as being the first designer to use oud. Some would argue it was Balenciaga Porom in 1990. I've heard people uh, make the case it's Balenciaga Porom for many reasons. Notice how stable it is. You know, oud doesn't uh, deteriorate over time. It actually will tend to... Um, get better as the years go on. Um, it, it, it ages like a fine wine, whereas other ingredients can break down. Oud doesn't necessarily do that. Uh, and so this is classified as something like a spicy woody fragrance. That date note makes it very unique. I love the fact that there is um, this traditional masculine sweaty vibe to the fragrance, you know, like this big hairy chested sweaty vibe, but in a modern way. There's another fragrance from 2004, Ormond Jane Man, that uses oud, and that's very like, you know, um, it, it's pleasant, it's nice, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. But I actually like this more when I wear them side by side. The Ormond Jane is probably seen as more classy, and, you know, this is seen as maybe a little bit more rugged. They both try to, tried to use Oud a couple years after M7 used it, you know, in its, in its 2002 release. And you have to remember, now we look back on M7, the original M7 that Tom Ford helped, you know, get put out by YSL. And we look back on it with fond eyes, you know, with hearts and uh, rainbows in mind. But back then it didn't sell well. It was actually a flop. It went to the bargain bin. No one wanted it. Uh, and so these houses were trying to kind of recreate it and use that oud note in a way that would sell. I think they did very good here. I think they did a great job here. And for the 20 bucks or something, I ended up getting this bottle for an absolute steal. And there's a black leather note in here, which I really like. And you guys know I love that leather note. This black leather uh, that you see around the bottle is actually a great representation of the black leather note that you get in here. It's, it's a great fragrance, fantastic fragrance. <clears throat> That's why I say uh, Rodrigo Flores Rue has a knack about creating these budget fragrances and doing a great job, kind of like Nathalie Lorson, same thing. She makes fragrances that are on a budget, but they smell 10 times higher than the price tag. He's done a great job with this line of doing that. Now, the one that everyone loves that... I struggle a bit with, not struggle, but I feel like I need to, to learn it more, you know? Uh, this came out a couple years later, and again, this is a 125 mil bottle, and again, it's EA fragrances, so it's, it's now being marketed by Revlon. Mine is the EA bottle. I've never smelled the Revlon bottle, and this is Vintage. So Vintage came out in 2006, a couple years after the original John Varvatos, uh, and... Vintage is considered to be spicy and leathery. Uh, there's a Santolina note, juniper berry, and white lavender. There's jasmine, patchouli, and fir balsam in the heart. There's a base of tobacco, tonka, and suede. You would think I would absolutely love this fragrance, but there's something about it that 
um, just doesn't sit right with me for whatever reason. When I smell it, uh, you know, I don't love it as much as I like the original. But I will continue to wear it and talk about it more and try to figure out what that note is that's bothering me. Uh, because there are some people that absolutely love this. They put this as their favorite John Barbados fragrance. Um, not me, but I, I, en I enjoy it, but I don't love it yet. I don't know if I ever will, but I will continue to wear it and try to report back. I'll do videos on all these. I've been putting off doing the videos on the full bottles because I've been going through all these samples because samples don't last. They can evaporate and all that stuff. And so it's kind of taken me away from um, doing full reviews on bottles. I need to kind of force myself to do that. Um, actually, you know what? Let me spray this. Let me just spray this just so I can try to remind myself of what it is. Um, let me make a note real quick. This is vintage. All right, let's spray it. Let's see what this is all about. See, I'm not getting that note that really put me off last time I wore it, but when I wore it last time, I wore it on skin. I'm wondering if it's not coming through on paper. Because I am getting the freshness of juniper contrasted with the herbal touches of lavender with some green. I guess the green could be the balsam fir. Yeah, I like this. I mean, I um I'm going to have to I'm going to have to um I'm going to have to wear it on skin and do a video on it, but uh that note that was bothering me or, or what I remember as bothering me when I wore it on skin last time, I'm not getting it here. Yeah, I'll have to do more testing on that. See, that's why it's important to continue to you know, keep your nose current and try, continuously try, especially when you have a big collection. Can't remember everything. Uh, 2010, he put out a fragrance, which I do plan on doing a video on very soon. I keep saying that and I keep putting it off, uh, but it will happen very soon. And this is Fougere Royale by the house of Hubigant, uh, considered to be the, um, considered to be the very first Fougere fragrance. And uh, he re this is the X-ray version. This was very kindly sent to me by Eddie. Eddie sent me this. Um, thank you, my friend. I really do appreciate it. I think he sent me like three or four care packages. He is absolutely amazing. Um, and so the idea here, Fougere Royale came out in the late 1800s, if memory serves. And um, they wanted to recreate it using modern uh, ingredients and stuff like that. So this is created by Rodrigo Flores Rue and Roja Dove. So they, they double teamed Fougere Royale. Uh, and they put their heads together and they came up with this spicy Fougere. And you can tell there is a lot of high quality ingredients in here. Uh, there's a beautiful lavender, top notch lavender note. Doesn't smell cheap at all. You know, sometimes lavender can come across as cheap if they're not using a good quality lavender. Um, beautiful lavender with herbs. Uh, lovely florals in here. You get carnation, may rose, absolute geranium, uh, ron ron de ron delicia ron delicia is a flower I am not familiar with at all. Cinnamon, amber, oak moss, kumar, and of course it's a fougere. Uh, mastic absolute, which I know is a note that Roja uses from time to time. Clary sage absolute, patchouli, and tonka bean absolute. And of course, the fougere structure, uh, the lavender, the geranium, and the tonka is all here. And uh, this is a very good fougere. The problem is, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this when I do a full review, but when I've sprayed this, um, I didn't get the impression that it was so much better than, uh, like for example, I own a, an Ubigant fragrance. And it's called Duc de Bourbon's La Extreme. And this is technically a fougere, and it's a very good one. And so for me, you know, is it worth paying three, four hundred dollars for Fougere Royale Extra or five hundred bucks? I don't know what it is. Um, 
when I already have a fougere I enjoy wearing so much from the same brand. Yes, they're different, but this is going to be a really hard sell. I mean, I'm going to have to really fall in love with this to, um, to buy a bottle. But if you are a fougere lover, I would strongly urge you to check out uh, Fougere Royale. Okay, next. So that was 2010. So now we're going to jump to 2013. And this is the missing gem in my collection. One of the missing gems. I always, I have a to buy list as long as my arm. But um, this is one that I did a video on. You can find it. If you go to uh, my channel, search for Sahara Noir, it'll come up. It's Tom Ford, Sahara Noir. All this writing is just some guy that I bought a fragrance from, he he threw this in and he wrote uh, golden tears, quote unquote, who knows if this is true, but he wrote golden tears and then he wrote WN, what is WN? Working name, asterisk, this formula predates even its chosen name, Sahara Noir, who knows if that's true or not, or some bull crap he fed me, but the fragrance is absolutely amazing. Um, I loved, absolutely loved this stuff. It's a lot of um, labdanum. This is one of the best labdanum fragrances I've ever smelled. A couple of my favorite labdanum scents. This, uh, Roja's $3,500 a bottle juice. Roja Houtlux, whatever you want to call it. Big labdanum note there. And Le Leon, Chanel's Le Leon. Uh, and this is so well done. There's some honey in here. The frankincense is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and the uh, incense here can come across sometimes as very green. Uh, it's just an amazing fragrance. I love it. If you check out my video on it, I think I did it justice, but it's full bottle worthy. I just can't pony up what, what people are asking for, uh, but I absolutely love that. If you get a chance, you know, if you're a lover of resinous, smoky, you know, oriental type fragrances and you love labdanum, uh, check out Sahara Noir. It's definitely worth a sniff. Even if you can't find a bottle, just smelling it once is an experience. Okay, next, uh, we're going to go to the year 2015. And in 2015, uh, actually, we're not going to go to the year 2015. I lied. Uh, we're going to save that. We're going to go to the year uh, 20... When did this come out? Um, 2015, yes. That's correct, 2015. Okay, so this is a uh, three-perfumer creation with Ann Gottlieb acting as product developer, who she is a absolute legend. Um, if, if you want to study a career of someone who is a serious influencer on fragrance trends and where the industry is going and getting out in front of trends, just study Ann Gottlieb's uh, career. She is, um, she's really something else. And, um, this came out in 2015. So the perfumers were Olivier Guillotine, Rodrigo Flores Rue, and May Pierre Julien. And they created this and it's called... Calvin Klein's Reveal for Men. Uh, cool bottle. You know, the cap is like a mirror. Um, big cap, heavy cap. Uh, and Reveal is a fragrance that I purchased off of Hype. And this was kind of a turning point in my collecting. Because I bought this based on the recommendation of Joy Amin. You guys probably know Joy. He's got like 70,000 subscribers. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, does a bunch of videos uh, in uh, Taka. I think he lives in Taka, Bangladesh. And this is where um, my thinking of how I collect changed because I blind bought this and, you know, he really raved about it. Oh, it's one of the best fragrances in my collection, blah, blah, blah. And I bought it and I was like, what the hell is this? Uh, this is absolutely... Uh, everything that I hate in a fragrance. And um, the reason is it's very sweet. And he talked about how unique the fragrance is. <laughs> and there is some truth to that because they use things like pear brandy, candied ginger, 
Kiwano. What the hell is Kiwano? I'm sure someone knows. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, agave, like the tequila agave. Uh, so they do use some unique notes. The problem is the sweetness. So when I reviewed, or when I did my early impression yesterday on um, Petty Shetty, um, I said that even if uh, Nathalie Feisthauer, who is the perfumer, put beautiful, um, you know, uh, writing underneath, even if the poem of the fragrance, the ingredients of the fragrance were high quality, even if she took all this time developing the formula and putting it out there, the fact that it was just so sweet is like taking a Sharpie and redacting everything. You know, it just covers everything up. This fragrance has the same problem for me. It's a very childish, um, sweet fragrance, and I hate sweet fragrances. Now, this is discontinued. I did get it for a very good price, so I'll probably just wait, you know, for years and, you know, once prices go up, maybe I'll sell it. I usually don't sell my fragrances, but this is one I might consider selling because it's just so sweet. I can't, I have a hard time wearing it, um, but I want to do a video on it first before I get rid of it. Um, but there's, there's even a suede note in here. Uh, there's suede, vetiver, tonka, amber, and mastic. And so for a designer, I guess it's somewhat unique. The problem is the sweetness. I mean, if you want to go to a bar with a bunch of college kids and smell good and smell like a college kid, sure, wear something like this. But for me, if I'm going to go to work dressed like this, I can't wear this. I mean, I'd smell like I just got home from the bodega. You know, it's uh, like I was out all night. It's, it's, the sweet fruitiness is very childish. And, you know, I, I feel the other thing is, these three or four perfumer creations never seem to work out. You notice that? They never seem to work out, ever. Like, take uh, Paco Rabanne's, uh, uh, what are they called, Phantom or something? There's like four perfumers working on that, and it smells like a complete mess. Um, so, yes, I mean, I don't feel like they should do these three, four perfumer creations because... I don't feel like anyone ever takes control and takes a chance. Like they all go the the safe way, the um, focus group tested to death. And I, I just don't like that. So that's probably my least favorite uh, Rodrigo Flores Rue creation. Although to be fair, he had other people, you know, and, and Calvin Klein in 2015 is not the most creative brand. My favorite Calvin Kleins are from the 80s, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. So let's go to a decant that I have here. Uh, this is a 2015 release, and this is discontinued. So by the way, this is discontinued, the Calvin Klein I was talking about, and this is discontinued. This is um, Dark Rebel by Jean Varvados. And uh, Dark Rebel, here, I'll show you the juice. If I can get it out. Uh, let's see. Okay, here you go. There's the juice color, champagne-esque. Uh, I really like this fragrance. This is a winner for me. Uh, this is much more my style, and the next one's even more my style than the Calvin Klein. So Dark Rebel is basically this leathery, spicy, boozy fragrance, okay? That's that's the broad stroke idea. There's things like Divana, which I love. Bertrand Duchafour loves to use Divana, and I started to re notice it in other fragrances here, it's done absolutely beautifully. Divana with Jamaican rum. Now, there is what they call Cuban sugar cane, straight sugar in this fragrance. And yet, because it goes with the rum, sugar and rum go together in a, in a sense. It's mixed with a lot of other things uh, that don't smell super sweet to me. There's tobacco leaf, uh, there's black leather, there's pepper, there's Styrax Absolute, there's Fur Balsams, which again he used um, in the vintage I was I, I sprayed earlier, which I'm actually really liking. I like it way more now than I remember liking it before, although that weird note is maybe starting to crop up a little bit on paper. Maybe it's just that green mixture with the tobacco and everything else, but um, I'll have to wear that on, on, on uh, skin. There's Akigala wood in here. Um, boss, uh, balsa wood, castorium in a designer release, castorium, tobacco leaf, Mexican vanilla, which I don't know what the difference is between vanilla and Mexican vanilla, and Canary Islands juniper. 
And um, so even though this is sweet, the vanilla in the base and the Cuban cane sugar in the top do add this element of sweetness. This is one where it's done properly and I can wear this. This is wearable to me. This is almost unwearable, you know, but um, the uh, Dark Rebel is, is wearable and it has one of my favorite notes, leather. There's a black leather note in here and it's boozy. So it's leather, it's boozy. I mean, if you like things like Idol de Luban, I prefer the EDT there, but even if you like the EDP, I would urge you to try, you know, something like this if you get a chance. It is discontinued, so it's going to be hard to find. Um, I'm very lucky to have this 10 ml decan. I got it for cheapest chips, almost nothing. Um, so yes, that's a very good designer. And then he doubled down on this fragrance, and he did a flaker. And, he, and this is one of my favorite fragrances he ever created. I'm going to spray this just to remind myself, because I love this fragrance. I need to wear it soon. Uh, dark Rebel Rider. So that's the fragrance. It's called Dark Rebel Rider. And um, let's give it a spritz, shall we? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love this stuff. This is really good. I need to wear this soon, too. Okay. So the idea with this fragrance is he took the um, skeleton of Dark Rebel. Oh, this is so good. And he added this Russian leather-like vibe. And if you know about Russian leather, oh man, this is really good. So if you know about Russian leather, um, there's this uh, birch, there's usually this smokiness that comes with Russian leather. If you like... Um, God, I love this stuff. If you like um, Russian leathers from the past, you know, the real Russian leather, the hardcore, you know, um, sour, smoky leather fragrances of the past, imagine you kept that accord but buried it underneath a modern creation, okay? So um, you, you, you took that old accord that very few people work with, Oh, man, this smells so good on paper. I mean, it smells great on skin, too, but, man, I, I don't think I've smelled this on paper. It's always on skin. Um, so it opens up with this aldehydic saffron, okay? So think about aldehyde, saffron, with touches of citrus. The citrus here is citron fruit, which is a underused citrus fruit. Um, you find it in stuff like Imitation Man, which is right there, I think, um, and... It's an underrated opening. Most people just do bergamot, you know, and move on. So the um, the uh, citron fruit kind of stands out a bit, but mostly it's it's swallowed up by the marjoram, the aldehydes, and the saffron. And then what makes this so attractive to me is there's high quality ingredients in here. There's Florentine iris. There's osmanthus absolute, which is not cheap. Uh, there's Somalian frankincense, and that frankincense is coming through right as I said it. Um, beautiful Somalian frankincense. Oh, it's so good. Tolu balsam. There's a black violet note, which I'm not, I've never compared black violet and regular violet, but there's a black violet note. There's labdanum. And the best part about this fragrance is the labdanum will remind you of Sahara Noir, which is very hard to find. Now this, uh, Dark Rebel Rider, by the way, Look at the presentation. It's an actual leather jacket. How cool is that? And this does unzip. I'm not going to try because it's a bitch getting it back, but it does unzip. Uh, it's a working, functioning leather. I mean, how cool is that presentation? I think that's badass. Um, uh, there's Tolu Balsam. Su Sumatra Benzoin. There's Cacao Absolute in the base with vanilla patchouli, atlas cedar, and that Russian leather accord, and some sort of woods, whatever the wood note they used here, probably some, you know, synthetic cedar, who knows, uh, but the point is, if you're a fan of leathery fragrances, if you're a fan, by the way, this is going to sound weird, because the two don't smell very um, similar, but the concept to me feels like the perfumers were trading notes and I know they're friends because I mentioned 
that they work together on Fougere Royale. But if you like this, whoops, sorry, not that. Let me, uh, let me put this back where I thought it was. Come on, baby. Stay. Okay, so if you like this, this is uh, Roja's Great Britain. You should smell this. You should try to get your nose on Dark Rebel Rider. The reason I say that, obviously this is more posh. This uses tons more iris uh, and probably real ambergris. At least he said, Roja says so. Who knows if it's true or not, but that's what he says. I love the color of that juice. I love the presentation too here on these purple caps. Uh, but if you like this fragrance, or if you like Dior's Queer Canage, that style, get your nose on Dark Rebel Rider. It's almost like a uh, designer take on that DNA. And and by the way, Great Britain is a Russian leather. I don't know if you know that, but it but it's a Russian leather. And since they're friends, wouldn't surprise me if they traded notes or ideas. And to be honest with you, there is very little difference in quality to me between the two. You might think that's an insane statement to make. I picked this up for $37 or something years ago. Um, and so this is a $2,000 perfume retail. Now, discounted, I got it uh, over half price off. But it's a very, the price difference is this. The quality difference is this to me, okay? And again, you might think I'm absolutely insane, but um, it's amazing. And this is one of my this is one of my favorite leathers. I always put this on my favorite leather list. This never makes my favorite leathers, but it probably should. Um, this is so good, very underrated. So kudos to Rodrigo Rodrigo Flores Rue. Um, he's done multiple interviews. You can find him on the interwebs if you do some searching. Uh, and so, yes, that is my perfumers portfolio video. Two perfumers deserve the credit. Uh, I'm glad we were able to knock them out. I'll put, I'll check them off the list. If you guys have uh, favorites, do let me know um, from their collection. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I love seeing your faces in the comments. I love reading your comments and thoughts. Uh, you guys are always enlightening, and there's so much knowledge in the community. It's just a, a pleasure and an honor to get to share some time with you. We've kept it under an hour today, which for me, we'll call it a short video. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be back either tonight with a very quick late night insight, as Rich Mitch would say, or uh, tomorrow, uh, depending on how much time I have. I do have to get some studying in. So cheers, guys, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye now.